we're going to start out, we'll go just down the line. Candidates will have three minutes to introduce themselves. We have timers here. I will stop you. If you hit three minutes, you'll be able to see them. I'll be able to see them. Then we have a couple of questions teed up. The candidates have seen these questions. Then we'll turn it over to youth. And youth can engage questions for a while. And if we have time at the end, it'll sort of be open mic. There are a few mayoral candidates that did not get registered by the deadline. Some of them are here. They'll get a few minutes at the end to address you as well. So uh, we will start out. You'll have three minutes to answer the questions when we get to the questions as well. Three minutes. Cool. Cool. So uh, without uh, further blabbing by me, I will just turn to the candidates and one at a time ask them to come up to the mics and take three minutes to introduce yourselves. Hello, everybody. My name is Sheila Nijad. My campaign is called Sheila for the People, and I'm so happy to be with you all today. So I want to get you get to know you all a little better first. Raise your hand if you live in Minneapolis. OK, that was just to get you warmed up. Raise your hand if you're a renter in Minneapolis. All right. Keep your hand up if you've ever worried about not being able to pay the rent. Yeah? All right. Raise your hand if you want justice in Minneapolis for George Floyd, Winston Smith, and Dalal Eid, right? Keep your hand up if you can imagine ways of keeping one another safe that aren't police. All right, this is why I'm here, everyone. I am a renter, I am a queer woman, I am a community organizer, and I've been doing work in Minneapolis for the last 10 years. I got my start in LGBT public health, where I was organizing for LGBT rights long before marriage was legal, long before we had a lot of the protections we have today. And I spent the last five years specifically working on violence prevention and alternatives to policing at the city level. It's a little uneven here. Um, and I've worked with a group called Reclaim the Block. And it's because of us working at the city, my colleagues and I, that we got our first ever mental health response teams that are hitting the ground this month. And that was because of organizing that we did. It's also because of our organizing that we had uh, the Office of Violence Prevention created. But these are just the first seeds of what we need to build safety in our community. And as mayor, I'm going to invest the most in safety, and it starts with our youth, right? We've been defunding schools, youth programming, housing for years and those are what we need to build stable communities so i believe that it takes community connection experience and policy knowledge to be a good elected official and that's why i'm asking to be your first choice for mayor this november thank you good afternoon how's everybody doing today good, good. how's everybody doing today good, good. all right i just want to say thank everybody for coming out again thank you to the organizers for being here thank you to the candidates um, for being willing to be accountable to the public. You see, not everybody that is in the race is up here, um, unfortunately, but it is what it is. I just wanna say, I'm not a polished politician. It's not something that I've looked forward to my whole life. A young man asked me the other day, have you always dreamt of being a politician? And absolutely not. But the reality that we are living in right now is so serious, it is deadly serious. My babies, I'm raising my babies. I have a 13-year-old little girl and a five-year-old little girl. And the things that we're dealing with today, I do not want them to have to deal with tomorrow when I'm gone. So I feel like I have no choice but to stand up and fight for what is right, what is righteous, what is justice for each and every one of us. Whether it's education, youth and young adult outreach, public safety, climate justice, housing, home ownership, small business ownership. There's so much work ahead of us. Usually a platform is two or three things, but we're dealing with so much stuff right now that is so vitally important. So what it is that we have to do is come together like we've never come together before. Our lives and our livelihoods depend on it. The lives of our babies depend on it. And the very future of our city depends on your vote 
this November 2nd. Whatever you do, just keep in mind, again, that your vote affects each and every one of us. And look at the babies. Look at the ones around us. They are going to have to look to the future, and we have to make the decisions today that can best form those opportunities for them. There's so much. So let me ask you a couple questions real quick. Do you want education investments? Do you want youth and young adult outreach investments? Do you want housing and home ownership investments? Do you want small business and small business ownership investments? Do you want public safety and climate justice investments? Then we must vote Mayor Perry to serve the people of Minneapolis. Thank you very much. How's everyone doing today? Good. Thank you for coming out. Great day, beautiful sunshine. My name's Mark Globus and I'm a candidate for mayor here in Minneapolis. I'm a Democrat and I want to make Minneapolis work for everyone, not just some, but for everyone. And I grew up a DFL Democrat and I believe in those principles. First thing I want to do today is thank the organizations that put this on. The second thing is I want to salute my fellow candidates up here. Sheila, Kate, AJ, Jarrell, Mike, thank you for coming out today. Uh, I don't know if you know what it takes to run for a public office like mayor, but it takes a lot. It takes a tremendous sacrifice, it takes a ton of discipline, it takes a ton of sparks, and it takes a lot of courage. Everyone up on this stage has earned my respect for their sacrifice, and they've earned their res my respect because they want to make this city a better place. Frankly, there's one thing that I think we can all agree on, and that is that Jacob Fry does not deserve another four years in office. <laughs> Jacob Fry has deserted this city. He has led our city astray. Let's talk about what I bring to the job of Minneapolis mayor and what I want to accomplish. As an attorney and business person, I bring the type of focus, business discipline, and background that makes me a very unique and relevant candidate for mayor. Most importantly, let me tell you how I am different. I'm a marketing expert and a business person. I will give Minneapolis back in the spotlight with a marketing-focused approach. I will make the perception of our city and the national media great. And I'll make sure that any marketing program that comes out of Minneapolis wins awards. Marketing is my strong suit. Secondly, if there is one person who is the housing candidate in the race for mayor, that person is me. Why? There is only one candidate who has actually developed and built housing, and that is what I've done for a living. Third, I'm not a politician. I'm a business person. I'm a problem solver. I've actually built businesses and projects which have created actual new jobs. I understand how get to get the job done on time and under budget. Where do I stand on the issues? Public safety, issue number one. There are a lot of different theories from candidates on how to best keep our community safe. I agree with some and I disagree with others. However, I understand where everyone is coming from with their position on public safety. One of the biggest lost opportunities right now is that the focus of the world has been on Minneapolis since the murder of George Floyd and the uprisings that ensued. We have the opportunity to harness the world's attention and spotlight in a very positive way. But the leadership at City Hall has totally squandered this opportunity because I will tell you more in the weeks and days coming. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mark beat up to a little bit of my time, so I'm going to keep mine a little bit more concise. Uh, but basically, so we know what moment we are really in in this year. Uh, I mean, I think this election cycle is unlike any other. There are a lot of challenges ahead. Uh, there's a lot of challenges the city faces. But the real reason and the motivating factor for me to run for mayor of Minneapolis is I am completely tired of the failure in leadership in city government. Uh, the city really is struggling, and it has to be conceived on a structural level. But more importantly, the people that we continue to elect 
are individuals that are willing to play quick politics and play rhetoric over and over and over again. The message for my campaign is quite simple. We need to come together as the city of Minneapolis to really answer these problems. So for me, that's the lens that I'm going to use to lead the city into a new era where the city of Minneapolis truly is better. So what does that really mean in the hindsight for public safety and all the other issues that we are currently facing? Homelessness, opioid, I mean education. This really means to me, for one, on public safety, we need to have the citizens validating whatever system we're moving forward. If the process that we got to have a new model of public safety really does not have the full trust and validation of the same communities that started what happened in 2020, then that's going to be dead in water five, ten years from now. So that's what I'm investing in, and that's why I'm suggesting to do it at Citizen Assembly. Taking a representative population, like there is right now in front of me, I see the city of Minneapolis pretty well represented. I see black folks, I see immigrants, I see white folks, I see LGBT, right? That's what the process for the new public safety system should have and be part of. Now, when we move on, the city also needs public housing. As you all know, privatization is going up. And for some reason, the current administration and the establishment have a vision to privatize public housing out of existence. Under AJ's administration, that's not going to happen. In fact, we're going to stimulate more growth, add more tools to the tool shed, so we can actually increase the budget. That means taxing people who can afford to pay. Now, as a Democrat, as DFLers, as a democratic socialist, I don't know when it became unfashionable to tax the people that can afford it. And that's what we need in the city of Minneapolis to get us out of the trouble we have. Thank you very much. I'm going to start with one basic observation. Right now in the city of Minneapolis, we are less safe because Jacob Fry is mayor. And when we're not safe, what do we do? We need to do something different and better. And what that means is we need a holistic, whole system approach to public safety. Jacob Fry as mayor has failed to deliver on two key promises. First, he's failed to reduce crime. Second, he's failed to reform police. The reason he's failed to do so is because he is beholden to the status quo. And the status quo is not the way we make progress toward a safer Minneapolis. That's why I support a whole system approach to public safety that includes policing. And a whole system approach that includes policing means that we ask police to do less so we can have them focus on what we actually need them to do, which is responding to, investigating, and actually making progress on solving violent crime in our city. Second, we need to rebuild trust with MPD. And rebuilding trust with MPD, it goes way beyond a PR campaign. What it means is true transparency when police have any kind of misconduct in our city and real accountability to the people of Minneapolis. Let me be clear, it is unacceptable in our city of Minneapolis for a child to get shot and killed. It is also unacceptable for police officers to kill someone in our city. And that is why my holistic vision for public safety in Minneapolis is one that will get to the root of the challenge and not just try to stay at the surface. You know, Mayor Fry hasn't seen this way forward. He, in the last few weeks, has put forward his budget, and his budget includes status quo funding for ongoing support of our Office of Violence Prevention. He also doesn't see it fit to support a holistic, common sense approach to a public safety system by supporting the public charter amendment. To be honest, I think it's a reckless approach, and that's why I'm running for mayor. I'm running for mayor because now, in this moment in Minneapolis, we need a mayor who can not just listen to, but actually hear what people want to do to move forward and can work within and through our systems of government to make it happen. As a mom, a climate strategist, a former state representative, a former chief resilience officer, a university program director, a small business owner, I have the skill the experience and the relationships to work across levels of government and with community to deliver on the Minneapolis that we know is possible. 
While I've heard a lot of divides and differences about our path forward, underneath all of that is the fact that people love our city of Minneapolis. And I know that tapping into that, we will make it through this moment and make it a real turning point towards a just, safe, resilient city. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, my name is Mike Winter, and I would like to move Minneapolis forward. I am the only candidate not associated with the DFL or the Republican Party. I'm with the IP, the Independence Party of Minnesota. So I am the most open-minded candidate up here. I want to work with the city. Whatever the city needs, I want to give the city. I don't care about the DFL, and I don't care about the Republican Party either. I'm a union steward with the Teamsters, very proud union member. I've come from a union family. I grew up in Minneapolis, and I went to Minneapolis Roosevelt High School. I still live in the city. My platform is three things. I would like to reform and refund our MPD, get it back up to full strength, and I agree with Kate on including other ways to handle problems in the city other than sending the police right away. It would take a lot off their plate and move the police to handle the more serious things. I'd like to revitalize our business community. In 2000 and uh, I think, no, in 2019, the Minneapolis Convention Center only had, well, they had 33 events. In 2021, they've only had 19. That's a big chunk of business that I feel like we're losing out on as a city. I've talked to business owners, small business owners here in the city, and they would like to see some laws eased up a little bit on licensing and zoning and things like that, and I feel like I can help there. Moving on to housing, which is a giant issue in the city. There's condos going up every day, more big apartment buildings. Now we have three-story buildings going up in neighborhoods that a lot of homeowners here in the city have a problem with. We have a lot of issues with zoning, and that is something that I would like to take a look at. There's been a lot of variances let go through. They're not creating any parking for these new buildings, and that's something that I would like to help with and change. Bottom line, again, not DFL, not Republican, right down the middle. I want to help you, not a party. Thank you. Starting with Mr. Perry. The first question is about public safety, and it is, what would be your approach to combat uh, ongoing public safety issues? Three minutes, Mr. Perry. All right, thank you very much. Well, first of all, public safety is more than the police, as it's been said already. Public safety is all-encompassing. Safety means something different to each and every one of us, and we can go back to that being education, that being youth and young adult outreach, housing, jobs, period. Uh, the police are a part of that, and so is climate justice. All of it is part of public safety. But I'm sure the question is more targeted towards the Minneapolis Police Department. The first thing that I would like to see with the Minneapolis Police Department is a residency mandate. I feel like if you're gonna protect the city, work for the city, be a public servant, you should be living within the city. That way we don't have to focus on trying to get to know the community, you'll know them. Those relationships will be built and that brings a form of safety that nothing else can provide. We have a mandate for over 888 officers in our city. Only 80 of them, according to city data, live in the city. That's over 800 officers that are coming from other cities. They're coming to work here, they're getting their paycheck, and they're taking it back to their city paying taxes, property taxes in their city, funding schools in their city, and that's taking money from residents of Minneapolis. Over $60 million a year alone, and that's just the police officers. That doesn't include the entire staff. That does not include the other outreach coordinators, just the officers. So that money should be back here in the city of Minneapolis so that it can benefit the residents that are here. Another thing with public safety, again, is climate justice, which there's another question about that, but air pollution affects people of color like no one else. We have some of the highest rates of asthma in the country, 
and a lot of that's coming from the cars. We have a plan to do hydrogen power. Hydrogen power is cleaner than electric. An electric car can go 100 miles on a single charge when a hydrogen power car can go over 300 miles on that same charge. California is already doing it. We're looking at a partnership with Toyota. They have a Toyota Mirai that starts at 50 grand. They're offering three years of free fuel to residents of Minneapolis for purchasing that vehicle. Zero emissions. Not only does it produce zero emissions, it cleans the air at the same time. So this is something that we have to do if we are serious about this, the health and well-being of our children. This is something that we can do right now. The federal government just provided Metro Transit. We talked to them last week. They got $4 million to start doing electric buses. And again, that has no comparison to hydrogen. We have to do this. We got to do it now. Thank you very much. What would be your approach to combat ongoing public safety issues? You know, I think everybody here uh, this afternoon knows that public safety is really the number one issue in this election. It is so important. And I want to start out by saying something unique. If abolition of the police is absolutely the most important issue in this election, then I think you should probably vote for Sheila Najad as your first choice. So that's unique to say that. But on the other hand, I believe our experiment in police abolition has actually failed us in the past 15 months. Because in the last 15 months, we have cut funding to the police by over 25%. This was caused organically and by early police retirements and PTSD. The result has been a failure in our city. Crime is up, murder is up, shootings are up. The safety of the city is moving in the wrong direction. We need, most of all, accountability and safety with the Minneapolis Police Department. Major changes are needed, and a bottom-to-top reorganization is needed at the Minneapolis Police Department. However, I think we need an approach that's a little bit more level. And one of the things we need to take into consideration is if the Yes for Minneapolis referendum is passed, on January 3rd, when our mayor takes office, I hope that'll be me, the police department will still be in existence. So we need somebody who's going to have a very level approach to policing. I think we need to look at everything in the police department, from how 9-11 calls are handled, which is a mystery to me when you call 9-11, they ask you a number of crazy questions, to the types of um, things the police are carrying in their utility belt, and types of handcuffs, and everything that the police use. It needs to be covered from bottom to top, a full reorganization. But I think we should stick with our current police department and work with them because we need to have the safety across the city. So thank you. I know it's a complex issue, but I know we can solve it. I know this public safety issue can be solved. And uh, I know Minneapolis can become a safe and vibrant community again. AJ Awad, the question being, what would your approach to combat ongoing public safety issues? Three minutes, Mr. Awad. Before I answer that question directly, I just want to take a step back because I think everybody recognizes and remembers the moment they all saw the horrendous film of George Floyd being murdered last summer. And that's the moment I want to take you back to because that was validation and testimony for everyone around the world to realize we have a huge problem in the city of Minneapolis. So thankfully, we've all come to that realization. I don't think anybody in the city of Minneapolis is going to question whether we need to transform and get racism, police brutality out of the system. That being said, when we're talking about public safety, as a black man, I want to be quite honest with everybody here. We're asking for dignity and respect. We're asking for officers out there to engage us the same way the mainstream communities are engaged, right? 
That does not mean, right, that I do not want officers. So for AJ's purposes, I want everybody to understand, and I want to make it very clear. AJ wants law, uh, uh, law enforcement. AJ supports police. What AJ does not support is racist police. And that's the conversation we're having this year. So how do we get that out of the system, right? How do we shift this outdated relic system, which is really much embedded in white supremacists, and we really have a new healing where everybody recognizes racism is no longer tolerated? We only do that by building trust. And the only way you do that is by bringing those same communities who feel marginalized, alienated, and distrustful of cops to be at the table signing the new public safety model away with their confidence. And we do that only with the path that I have as running for mayor, which is the citizen assembly. Most people are really probably confused of the concept, but it's been done over and over and over again through many nations on many controversial is issues. The people should have that decision, not outside groups, and definitely not a small community of people wanting to sell one model. And that's what I want to deliver for the people in Minnesota, I mean Minneapolis. I want to deliver a model that everybody believes in and inherently trusts, and it's going to include, of course, everything that we're presently talking about. Remember. Everybody's saying yes to social workers. Everybody's saying yes to mental health professionals. Everybody's saying yes to disarmament. So for people who's hijacking what abolish, defund, and disarm means, we are winning and people are already getting that. So we don't need to go any further. We don't need to radicalize and push off people from sensible policy solutions. That's what the city of Minneapolis needs, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing else, nothing more. Sensible policies that address inequity in our city. Thank you very much. The question is, what would be your approach to combat ongoing public safety issues? Three minutes, Ms. Well, thank you for this question. It is the question of this campaign. It is the question of this moment in the city of Minneapolis. The questions I get asked when I am out around the city, north, south, east, west, downtown, in the neighborhoods, is what are you going to do about public safety? What are you going to do about policing? And I say public safety and policing are the issues of the campaign, and they are related, but not the same. The next question people want to know is, what are you actually going to do? What are you going to do about public safety? And that's why several months ago in my campaign, my team and I worked with dozens of community leaders and public safety experts to develop a, a plan to build community safety and transform policing here in Minneapolis. And this plan, a comprehensive plan, I'm the only candidate who has put one out, includes five key pillars. First, economic security is the foundation of safety in all of our lives. You need to make sure every person in our city has a safe place to come home to, has a job that means they can support their family and put food on the table, bring them to the doctor if they need to. Second, we need a whole system approach to public safety. What that means is that, yes, I support a public safety charter amendment because it enables us to go all in on investing in the things that we know keep people safe. I want to see an Office of Violence Prevention, Fire, Emergency Management, Police, all under the authority of a public safety department with civilian control. Third, we need to invest in young people in our city, especially young men. We need to make sure young people see that their city cares about them, that they're wholly enmeshed in who we are as a city and bought into the future of Minneapolis. So they are creating a positive future for themselves and our community as a whole. Fourth, we need to unbundle. There's a policy wonky word for you. What it means, we need to ask police to do less so they can focus on what them, we need them to do most. We need to transform policing so it is something that we see as a benefit to our community and where we are completely transparent about police misconduct and completely transparent about the racial injustice in our current city where, for example, black people in our city are arrested and searched at 29 times the rate of white people. That's unacceptable. We need to name it and we need to fix it. Finally, the fifth pillar of my plan is active leadership. As your mayor, I will step forward into and through this work with you and I will look to other places around the country. We are not the only city dealing with this. I will work with groups like Cities United 
like the Center for Justice and Policing. I'll look to places like Syracuse and Denver and Berkeley where they are figuring out different and better ways to keep every person, every person in our community safe. And that is the foundational value of how I will approach public safety. Everybody in our city, regardless of race, income, age, zip code, gender, or level of ability, deserves to feel and be safe. That's not the Minneapolis we live in now. And as mayor, that is the vision of Minneapolis. I will be working alongside and with you to create. What would be your approach to combat ongoing public safety issues? Three minutes, Mr. Okay, yes for Minneapolis, it's a no for me. I'll tell you why. There's way too many moving parts. And then they wanna have 14 bosses of that big plan with all the moving parts. I, it's a nice idea. It reminds me of that song, Imagine by John Lennon. I love that song. But right now, Minneapolis needs its police force back. It needs to be reformed top to bottom. As your mayor, I will not stand for any kind of racism. People like that have no place on the MPD. I think we have a great chief now that I'm very excited to work with and continue reforming the department. I don't know if any of you have ever gone out on a ride along with a Minneapolis police officer just to show of hands, anybody? Good, more of you should. It's a tough job. I rode with the Minneapolis Park Police for one afternoon. I thought it'd be pretty chill. We'd go around some parks, he'd tell me some stories, and I'd head home. I was nervous the whole time during the day. Just sitting in a Minneapolis police car, I was nervous. Not because of the community, because of what happened last year. And all the animosity that's directed to the police department now. And it's, it's earned, it's deserved. But there are, plenty, all, there are plenty of good, courageous cops that stayed on and wanna do the job right. And you've got to give them a chance. If they don't get community support, it's never going to work out. I'd like to have more cops living in the city. And I asked them, like, why don't more of you live here? They're scared to live here. That's what I was told, that they'd be harassed and picked on and maybe have their houses graffitied. I'd like to have more cops move into the city. Maybe we can offer a small property tax break as an incentive to get them move it back here again. But my public safety is including the social workers and the mental health. I agree with Kate on that. But I'd like to get the, the Minneapolis Police Department back up to, I think it's 743 officers where it belongs. So, thank you. What would be your approach to, uh, to combat ongoing public safety issues? Yeah, thank y'all. Well, we got quite a wide variety of opinions up here. So again, my name is Sheila Nijad. I am an organizer who's worked on violence prevention and alternatives to policing for years. And let me tell you a story of what I've seen with my own eyes of safety and practice. And it was just over the road over there. I came by on a Thursday evening, invited to visit the Little Earth Protectors. And the Little Earth Protectors, for those of you who don't know, are elders and youth who come out at night and make sure that the community is safe. And that's what community safety looks like. You know why there's safety there? Because there's relationships. You know why there's safety there? Because there's housing. These are the things that we have some of the biggest disparities of in Minneapolis. So when we talk about building safety, we need to stop evicting encampments over and over again with no culturally competent solutions. We need to invest in harm reduction. That's right, yeah. When we talk about safety, we need to be looking at safety models that protect black, brown, and indigenous lives. Y'all, don't forget history in this moment. It was not just the murder of George Floyd. It was the murder of Dante Wright, Breonna Taylor, Terrence Franklin, Jamar Clark, 
so many others. In Minneapolis, we've tried a lot of things. We've got body cameras. Derek Chauvin was filmed in broad daylight and kept doing what he was doing. We know that the reforms we have tried, if they would have worked, they would have worked by now. You know, the first, the first politician actually to recommend more training as a way to reduce police brutality. Anyone know who it is? No? Um, it was, oh no, now their name is escaping me. Uh, <laughs> it was 70 years ago. It was 70 years ago that it was first proposed that we should train police so that they are less violent. But safety, safety comes through relationships. Safety comes through housing. Safety comes when we create a city that is not reliant on guns and cages to resolve harm. I did not forget last year. I did not forget standing with the medics who are here today. I was out with them, keeping people safe as we protested a government that was shooting kids with rubber bullets, blinding people. Do not forget this moment. This is our chance, y'all. This is our chance to do something better, to step boldly into movements that are led by BIPOC working class people. Thank you. The next is a question that was provided to the candidates before, and it's kind of a complex question, so I'll repeat it each time. Uh, we'll also move one down the row to start, so it'll be uh, Mark Globus, who goes first for three minutes on this environment and climate related question. Uh, candidates, what is the scale of funding at the city level to address climate change locally that you would like to see? Where would this money come from and how should it be equally distributed? Uh, relatedly, how will you help city residents better prepare for extreme weather long term and uh, in emergencies. Mark, go us three minutes. So if environmental policy is absolutely the most important issue to you in this mayoral campaign, then I think you should probably vote for Kate Knuth as your first choice. She is a four-star general when it comes to the environment. I don't think there is somebody who has more knowledge on that area. If, however, you believe that climate change is one of many important issues that have gotten worse under Mayor Fry's leadership, I'd ask that you vote for me as your first choice. Climate change is a global emergency. All bodies of government must take part in addressing this, and the mayor's office must as well. In addition to listening to policy experts, I'm committed to common sense solutions so that we can fight this problem. For example, one of the reasons I'm in favor of reforming the Minneapolis Park Board is because they can be doing a much better job as environmental stewards of the Park Board. I'd like to see them do a little less politics. There's some inefficiencies, there's redundancies. We could save money by working with that department and rolling them into the city charter. Also, uh, when Mayor Fry took office, uh, the forestry department received about eight cents of every tax dollar, of property tax dollar pay. Under Mayor Fry, that has fallen. Our parks are so important, but they've fallen to about seven cents per dollar. And recently, the park board voted to eliminate its special forestry level. That's, uh, it's got a, a trying to get 10,000 boulevard trees per year, which is a very, very important goal. There are also a number of simple zoning and planning changes that can make our city more green. As somebody who's done ground up projects, I know that doing, working in LEED certified buildings and options like that can really uh, add to uh, how a building functions and it can save, on, save a lot of energy. We need to fund our parks and fund this issue with climate change. One of the best ways to do that is to reverse Jacob Fry's property taxes to millionaires who are living in this city. Most who have done better under COVID situations. 
I appreciate your time. The environment is extremely important and the mayor's office needs to be a leader in this area. AJ, so uh, what is the scale of funding at the city level to address climate change locally that you would like to see? Where should this money come from and how should the, it be equally distributed? And relatedly, how will you help residents better prepare for extreme weather in the long term and in emergencies three minutes yeah thank you for the question um so i will for, for me first and foremost you know I, I have my jd not um anything climate related uh, adr and commercial international transactions but um from what i'm understanding this really falls under the neighborhood promise that i'm trying to uh uh get the community and the city of Minneapolis really to buy into, which is really when we're talking about reducing the footprint, when we're talking about reducing the negative impacts of climate change, and we're talking about doing that very much in the BIPOC communities who are disproportionately affected by it, uh, we need to really invest in those neighborhoods. So what does that mean and what does that look like in an Awet administration? That means we're not going to have a top-down approach in the city hall where cities are just told what they need to do and how they need to do it. Uh, or grants are given out in ways that are pretty much arbitrary without real guidance and direct inventance with purpose, right? So we need to be purposeful with our investments and grants and opportunities that we're given neighborhood organizations. And that's where I want to invest in. As an executive director at currently at a neighborhood organization here in Minneapolis, the Cedar River Size Neighborhood Organization, um, we did great work last year in 2020 with COVID. And that's because the city really utilized us as on the ground experts, having the deep community connections to really do outreach work. So in that same context, when we're talking about having people renovate their homes or having less foot traffic, as the city continues to grow, we need to invest in the neighborhoods. All the neighborhoods, I was doing a city tour, uh, you know, I mean, obviously in preparation for the campaign and learning more about the city, and every single neighborhood has its own unique character. And every single neighborhood has a nice little district or a corridor or a business center, and we need to put money in them because ultimately if we have people driving less, right? And we have them being able to shop and entertain and do all the fun things within their neighborhood as the city continues to grow. That's the way that we can collectively reduce, you know, admissions and do the work. But I will say, uh, uh, you know, to be completely transparent, I want people like Kate in the caliber that she has in that field working with me, right? And that's really what we need from the city of Minneapolis uh, uh, leadership, and that's what we need from the mayor. Being able to recognize yourself when you have a deficiencies on a specific subject matter, but willing to extend the reach and really bring in the coalition of people that can work and deliver that good work for the community at large. Thank you. Kate Knuth, the question, what is the scale of funding at the city level to address climate change locally that you would like to see where should this money come from and how should it be e equitably distributed? And relatedly, how will you help the city residents better prepare for extreme weather, weather long-term and in emergencies? Three minutes. Well, thank you for the question and thank you for the shout out. I don't feel like I need to prove my expertise on climate given the comments by the other candidates. Um, I want to start with the fact that the climate era is here. The era of the climate crisis is here and we've all felt it in Minneapolis. I don't know about you, but I did not like having to learn how to figure out how to check air quality in my city on a regular basis. I did not like telling my daughter she could not go out to play one evening because the air quality was too bad and it was unhealthy for her and her little lungs and for every other kid in our community. So the question to me is not how much to go to climate change in the budget, it is how do we take on the climate crisis with the scale and with the urgency necessary, necessary so we are doing our part here in Minneapolis and making sure every family and neighborhood in our city overall is prepared for what's to come. And that means we look at every single budget through the lens of climate change, whether it's how we, invest our public, um, how we invest our public works, how we invest in our buildings, how we invest in our public safety system. It needs to understand that we are moving through the era of the, of the climate crisis. That's why I will soon be putting forward a Minneapolis Green New Deal because it will help us meet the challenge of the moment and of, frankly, the rest of our lives. So what does that look like in practice? What, let's take it down. What does it look like? First, climate justice. And by climate justice at the city level, I mean some neighborhoods are less prepared to navigate the climate change era. 
neighborhoods that were redlined that now have people with lower income and more people of color on hot days are up to 10 degrees hotter than other neighborhoods. We need to invest in white roofs. We need to invest in an urban tree canopy. We need to invest in things that we know will keep people safer and communities more highly impacted. Second, we need to take on natural gas. Natural gas is 41% of the emissions in our city. Right now, we ask people to figure out insulation and efficiency, find your utility. There's all these programs. That's hard. How do we mobilize at the scale necessary? We as a city, as mayor, I will convene and figure out with a team of experts, community leaders, people on the ground, how to use all of the resources we have to focus going house by house, block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, to do the work on insulation, electrification, to make our houses less costly to run for families, more comfortable to live in, and less harmful impact on the climate. Third, we need to take on climate resilience. We have already felt the impacts. When Mayor Fry took office, I was our city's chief resilience officer. I told him at the time, our city does not have a climate resilience strategy. He said, well, that's a problem. I said, yes, it is. We need to work on that. Uh, St. Paul released its first climate resilience strategy in 2019. What has Mayor Fry done on climate resilience? Nothing, as far as I can see. That's unacceptable, given the experience of heat and smoke and huge rain events in our city. So I look forward to working with you all, with bringing together our whole community to make us the world leader as a northern city full of the diverse, the smart, the capable, the committed people that make up Minneapolis. We can make this city a safe, resilient place to live for every single person in it. Candidate Mike Winter, the question, what is the scale of funding at the city level to address climate change locally that you would like to see? Where should this money come from? And how should it be equitably distributed? And relatedly, how will you help uh, city residents better prepare for extreme weather long-term and in emergencies? Three minutes, please. Well, I think we're all agreed that Fry needs to go. So, and it's like what Kate said, he hasn't done anything to protect the city during his term environmentally or public safety wise. I am not an environmental expert. That's Kate. I'll say it again, okay? <laughs> My big problem lately is Lake Hiawatha and the lack of leadership that's going on with that. Lake Hiawatha constantly floods Hiawatha Golf Course. They pump about 10,000 gallons of water out of there a day. The lake is getting dirty. The course is, you know, barely hanging on. They can't figure out what to do with it. Turn it into a nine hole, leave it an 18 hole. At the same time, you've got people with houses down there that are below the floodplain for the lake and they're starting to worry about losing homes. What do we do? I've been talking to a couple people about a project that's still in development called the Hiawatha Project which will alleviate these issues for Lake Hiawatha, the golf course, and help enrich the community. That is what I'm willing to do, what I know about, to help the city. As far as the other concerns, I would go out and get somebody like Kate to help me. So <laughs> I'm just gonna admit that. Um, I, I guess that's it. Thanks a lot. Candidate. Uh, Sheila uh, Nejad, let me ask the question. What is the scale of funding at the city level to address climate change locally that you would like to see? Where should this money come from? And how should it be equi equitably distributed? And relatedly, how will you help city residents better prepare for extreme weather long term and in emergencies? Three minutes, please. Wonderful. Thank you for this question. So. North Minneapolis and Phillips are the most polluted areas of the city. And you know why? It's environmental racism, right? So every policy in Minneapolis is a climate policy. Every policy in Minneapolis is a racial justice policy. And it's either making it better or it's making it worse, right? And no action is making it worse. So as mayor, you know, politicians, they come and they go but community stays. 
And that's why I support community-driven, community-sustained projects like the East Phillips Indoor Urban Farm. So one of, yeah, all right, Ethne. Uh, so one of the things I would do as mayor is support heavy, shutting down heavy polluter sites like the Roof Depot site could be, like the Herc, like the um, Northern Metals plant, right? And reimagining the Upper Harbor Terminal to replace them with community-led projects that create green jobs, that create um, food for our communities, right? And that um, improve climate justice for our city, right? And all integrated, right? Because it, you can't separate it out. In terms of emergency preparedness, right? In this last heat wave, people died. People who were living outside died because of the heat wave, because there were not places to cool down, and because Metro Transit increased fines on the light rail and buses, y'all. We literally further criminalize homelessness at the expense of people's lives. So as mayor, I'm going to decriminalize homelessness as much as I can in the city and pressure my colleagues at the state, county, and federal levels to do the same because that's also a climate justice issue, right? We can open more cooling sites. We can, um, thank you very much, distribute air filtration systems and make sure that we're prepared that the next time a heat wave comes, we're ready. And winter comes too, right? It's hard to imagine it right now. But one of the parts of my platform that I'm so excited about is a municipal sidewalk shoveling program. So how many of y'all have fallen on the ice? Huh? Yeah, a lot of people have fallen on the ice. But it's not just about that. It's about reducing salt that's polluting our waters. It's about making sure more people can take transit. It's an accessibility issue. And it's going to be able to open the pathways for more community-led environmental justice, racial justice, uh, disability justice projects to happen in our city. Thank you. Next will be uh, Joel Perry. Mr. Perry, three minutes to respond to the question. What is the scale of funding at the city level to address climate change locally that you would like to see? Uh, and where should this money come from? And how should it be equitably distributed? Relatedly, how will you help city residents better prepare for extreme weather long term and in emergencies? Three minutes, Mr. Perry, please. Thank you. Well, I'll start off by saying I don't personally know the scale of the cost. I don't believe any of us do. None of us have all the right answers, but what that's going to take is bringing people together, bringing community together, being willing to listen to people. Our indigenous family, they know how to do most of this. All we have to do is trust each other, rely on each other, and not just hear, but listen to each other. The scale of funding is there. The federal government, we're in a cold red crisis right now. This is not just Minneapolis. This is a global thing. And again, if we come together, it's something that we can get taken care of. As far as things like recycling, I will put a deposit on the cans. My family is from Des Moines, Iowa. There's a deposit on all the cans and stuff that are bought, and people take them back instead of polluting, further polluting our environment. So that's one thing that we can do. And red when i'm talking about color red that's the last stop on the gauge if you can picture a gauge it starts at green right and it stops at red red is the door of no return so we got to back all the way up green light yellow light red light right my thing with climate justice and as far as protecting people during emergencies we have to protect renters and to do that i'm going to double property taxes on homeowners and cut that in half for owner-occupied units. There's no way that we should have hedge funds and people that don't live in the city simply preying on the residents of Minneapolis. That's something that we can no longer tolerate and it's something that I'm gonna stop on day one. Another thing that we can do is like I was talking about earlier, having these conversations. My campaign talked with Metro Transit. We're looking at they're currently doing electric buses. They just got a $4 million grant to do electrical buses. Moving to hydrogen power. And that's something that, again, I learned through community conversations, through sitting down with indigenous leaders. I don't know if anybody knows Mino Kabai, but he, he ain't that mean. He's 
smart. He has wisdom. And again, if we just take the time to listen to these people, to listen to each other, there's no limit to what we can do. So we got to do that. Thank you. We have time. I think candidates, if it's okay with you, will shorten the response time to two minutes. And I think we can get two questions from the community. And so I have up here first uh, that uh, volunteered to ask questions. They got to be questions that all candidates can act. It's Mike Forsha. Hey, great. Uh, my name is Mike Forsha. I am chairman of the American Indian Movement in Twin Cities. Um, I've been helping and working with the homeless for the last 10, 15 years. And I'm currently working with the fine people over at Homeward Bound. Um, and tomorrow around 10, I'm going to have a tour of Franklin and Cedar. I have uh, a senator and her entourage coming down and a couple of mayor uh, candidates maybe. You're all invited. Um, my question is, uh, we all know that we're on stolen land, right? Everyone here, raise your hand if you know we're on stolen Indian land, right? Um, and we have Native homeless. That should not be, ever. Would all of you consider land back? We are in a paradigm shift since George Floyd. Um, would you consider giving Powderhorn Park, Fairworth Park, or Minnehaha Park back to the natives so we can eliminate our homeless population and we can create jobs, green jobs, uh, treatment for our homeless? Would you be willing to give land back? That's my question. Miigwech. And so we'll go starting this time with uh, AJ Awad. Your first two minutes on the question from the community. Would you consider giving land back to Native people? I mean, a good, lo uh, good leader should be always considering new options, especially when there's a need for it. Um, so that's definitely something that should be considered at all times. Uh, specifically, though, with this issue of homelessness, because it really does touch my heart myself. Um, somebody that grew up in public housing, I did not really have that security when I was young. Uh, and I had 11 siblings, so a two-bedroom is really, really snuffy when you're, when you're 11 deep. Oh, so you understand. I mean, and many uh, immigrant communities have that, right? So for me, um, we have to really start thinking broader and talk about answering the fundamental question, which is why there isn't enough affordable housing and making sure people have housing as a fundamental human right. And the way we get there, one of the proposals that I have, and you can look on my website, right, is, is, is the uh, pub, uh, uh, housing for all promise, which really talks about not just rent control, right, but a holistic approach. Rent stabilization is one factor, but we need to have incentives. And that means taxing luxury apartments and luxury apartments, people that are moving in from Seattle, the coast, right, that do have means to afford these luxury apartments, I immediately is one of those people. So I want to tax myself. Because once you have that tax base, then you can turn around to the development world, like this guy here, Mark, and say, we want you to build more affordable housing, and it's going to be capped. We have more negotiation leverage, right? And that's what I think the people of Minneapolis are willing to do. I know neighbors that are willing to pay a little bit more on their rent so they can secure housing for everyone else. And that's the thing that we need to start talking about. How do we grow that pie so we can build more and make sure that people that are well off can pitch in and we can really be a united city because we should all take care of each other. Thank you very much. Next is Kate Knuth, candidate. The question is, would you consider uh, giving land back to Native people? Well, thank you for the question and thank you for your leadership with AIM. It's really important going back decades in this city. I know this is the place where it started. So. Um, I think we need to consider land back. And I think with East Phillips Urban Farm is a great example. You know, one of my real frustrations with that site is an absence of mayoral leadership that has basically resulted in pitting city staff against neighbors in a community that has been over by pollution, overburdened by pollution and harmed in various ways by city decisions for decades. We need a mayor who's going to work in partnership with community to not force the question the way it was and to actually find financing and support to actually move the project forward. So that's a, a potential example right in front of us that I think there's been extremely, um, like been wonderful community leadership. Um, another part of it that, that this is not a, a, the question you asked, but I think it's related is making sure that 
when I am mayor, I am working um, government to government with tribal leadership and using the office to push on and protect treaty rights. So I have long opposed line three as an example of this and water protectors up north and um, indigenous leaders across our, our state and frankly now country are coming to say, no, it is not acceptable to build a pipeline through indigenous land, potentially harming water and Monoman wild rice, such an important cultural um, food, foundation of culture for indigenous people in our community. As far as homelessness, um, we need to be meeting unhoused people in our, neighbor, in our community with empathy and respect. And we need to ramp up supports to move people from being unhoused into housing that works for them. We actually have some decent providers, but they have not been invested in enough. And we have not built the scale of response needed in Minneapolis. There's been some great examples of leasing or buying hotels, moving from hotels into homelessness, given the housing and therefore homelessness uh, crisis that we've been experiencing in Minneapolis. We need to think bigger and with more compassion and empathy and focus on what works at the root. So thank you. For candidate Mike Winter, Mr. Winter, would you consider giving land back to native people? It's a good question. Yeah, I would. I don't even need to sit around and consider it. I do. You should. Pick one. Yeah. I mean, of course, we'd have to put it to a vote. It'd have to go through the city council, and the city would have to vote on it. I just can't decide that. But I'm for it. I think you'd do a better job with it. And uh, we'd stick houses on it and businesses and whatever. Sure. Good. We've got all kinds of empty businesses in Minneapolis, and I think it's going to get worse with more people deciding to work from home and companies not wanting to pay the big rent downtown anymore. I think we could repurpose a lot of those commercial buildings downtown to a, either really affordable housing or free housing for the homeless. That's a big idea, and there's a lot of moving parts but it would be a lot better than those buildings just sitting there empty, right? Waiting for tenants that are n probably never going to come. So, yeah, I'm for you getting a piece of land back and doing with it whatever you want. Thanks. <laughs> Sheila and Ajad, same question. Would you consider giving land back to Native yeah. Americans? Yeah, thank you. Miigwech for that question. So my background is I mixed. Uh, my dad is an immigrant from Iran, and my mom is from Fond du Lac. So I support the land back movement, absolutely. And doing mutual aid work in Minneapolis, I've seen the, yeah. the continuing legacies of white supremacy and gatekeeping in our housing system. Even when the pandemic hit and um, there was the Sabo encampment, right? We went to get water and, and uh, hand washing there. And the businesses we would park kind of by like the target, you know, and the businesses which weren't open were so mad that we were providing mutual aid to people who are living outside that they blocked the path. So we couldn't park in their empty parking lot with a log. So to me, you know, there are simple places where we can start. And also, you know, there's a lot of empty housing too. You know, we don't, we don't have to start with empty parks. We could start with the empty housing and it comes down to self-determination which is a core value of my campaign. I believe in cultivating the conditions of self-determination. And in order to get there, that means everyone has the things they need to survive, the housing, food, income. That way we don't have this patronizing state who gets to say, you get to live here, you don't get to live here. You get to live here, but you have to go cold turkey on day one, otherwise you're out right away, right? Harm reduction is important too. So yeah, let's figure it out. Let's make it happen. Perry, Mr. Perry, same question, two minutes. Uh, would you consider giving land back to Native Americans? I wouldn't just consider it, but I would absolutely fight for it. Absolutely. This is something that I've learned again through these community conversations, sitting down with indigenous leaders, learning that history, learning even about the murdered and missing indigenous women and girls, learning about the over 6,000 children that were found 
underground at boarding schools. And I thank God for Miss Tammy. I don't know if she's still here, but she came to make sure that we knew that there was an observance two minutes and 15 seconds at 2.15 today in remembrance of those lives. So absolutely lamb back. That starts with Fort Snelling, right there. That's where we're gonna start at. And homelessness, we put all these labels on people. We don't wanna keep doing labels. These are our brothers and sisters who are temporarily without shelter. Our brothers and sisters, each and every one of us, we're all family. We look a little different, we talk a little different, walk a little different, we're all family. Recognize it or not, I'm your brother and you're my brother or sister. So l let's, let's get to that point, okay? And then we can move forward. I've been there before. Me and my family have been homeless before. But thank God we were, willing, we were able to get a hotel room to get through that little down spell in our lives because God is good. And as long as we rely on him, he can get us through anything, just like he can get our city through everything that we are dealing with right now. Again, coming together and just knowing where all of our help comes from. Initiating a housing first program, unconditional housing. We got a lot of shelters, but there's so many conditions. This will be unconditional with wraparound social services to help our brothers and sisters get up on their feet. Affordable housing. We got all these big towers going up. They were just talking about it. 16, 17, 1800 dollars a month. That's not affordable. What's affordable to you may not be affordable to me. What's affordable to me may not be affordable to you. It has to be capped at 30% of your income, and that's it. Not everybody else's income, but your income. It has to be individualized to meet each person exactly where they're at. And then create a ladder from there to go up to affordable home ownership. Once you rent for five years consistently, you should be eligible for a grant anywhere in this city, especially our indigenous family, who this land belongs to. We know that, we all know that. It's only selfishness that will keep us from acknowledging that and keep us from acting on that. That goes to business ownership too. B business ownership investments, affordable housing investments, affordable home ownership investments. And all of that takes land. So absolutely land back. Thank you for the question. Mr. Globus, would you consider giving land back to Native Americans? My great question, interesting question. I do projects similar to this and, you know, when I first heard it, I, that's interesting. But you know what? I say let's be innovative and I say we can do it all. I'm thinking about Worth Park. It's a huge park. I don't see why there can't be areas of Worth Park that can be used better and uh, do some um, affordable housing there and uh, do all sorts of things. You need to look at the site plan. You need to really look at this, respect what you're asking. It's a really great question and there's a lot of land there. And I think, I think if we think about things in an innovative way and we try to be creative, we can deliver for a lot more people than we are now. And uh, when I first heard your question, I thought, wow. And, uh, but I started thinking about it. And I've done a lot of projects. And there's, there is excess land. And there's things where we can do more. You can have a better density. You can take better advantage of the land. So I embrace that. Let's be innovative. And, and let's accomplish that. Thanks for the question. Final question from the community. Yep. Buju, my name is Cassandra Holmes, and I'm a resident here at Little Earth of United Tribes. Um, so Kate has touched a lot about um, the East Phillips Indoor Urban Farm Project, and also talked a lot about how we are one, like in the county, this area is the polluted, most polluted in a section of Northside, um, polluted areas and it is the most diverse and uh, BIPOC community, poorest community, um, to speak plainly. But my question is this, um, how many of you um, others know about the East, uh, East Phillips Indoor Urban Farm right here at the Rift Depot site where they plan on, the city plans on adding more pollution toward, uh, more pollution here in our community? They're pretty much signed in our death sentence. I wanna know what you know about it, what you think about it, and I really want an honest answer because Jacob Fry in the past, before he was mayor, looked me in the face and told me he supported it. 
And then once he got into office, never gave us the time or day again. And actually vetoed or voted against anything that we try to do. So I want to know if, how you guys are going to hold yourself accountable to us as a community when you guys are on platforms that we give you to tell us what you want to do for us. And then when you get in office, how are you going to hold yourself accountable to make sure that you follow through with what you guys promised to do? Thank you. Well, thank you, Cassandra, for the question. And I, thank you to the East Phillips community who I have come to visit. Um, with one actually the one of my first in-person campaign events was to learn about the east phillips urban farm and how it is the vision of it is to build um, a place to build community to build safety to build food and to build justice in the face of a community that has way too for 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 decades borne way too much of the burden of industry and traffic and pollution in our city and so absolutely i will be a partner in figuring out how to move the East Phillips urban farm uh, vision forward. You know, as far as what I know about it um, from the challenges, because this, this has been like from an actual governance perspective, there are some challenges. The city has said they have spent $12.5 million of uh, water utility money that would need to be paid back. So that's money we need to figure out how to pay for. And I think we can do that as a community. And we as a community should embrace the vision that East Phillips has come together to create. And as mayor, I will absolutely be a partner in figuring out the financing, figuring out the legalities, and figuring out um, how to support the community vision moving forward in East Phillips. Uh, in terms of holding myself accountable, people will ask me, what do you hope at the end of four years as mayor? And at the most foundational level, I want each of you, every person in our city of Minneapolis, to believe that our city government is your partner and ally in making the community you want to live in. And the only way to do that and to achieve that vision as mayor is to absolutely hold myself, my team, my fellow electeds accountable and to ask people in the community to show up with education of, elect, of, of me as mayor, with ideas, with asks for support, and if I screw up, Tell me that too and come forward with accountability. I will embrace that. I have been an elected official. I can tell you stories where Time's I screwed up. up. And I look forward to working with you to build East Phillips and to be the kind of elected official that builds trust in our city government. Next is Mike candidate Mike Winter. Uh, what do you know about the East Phillips Urban Farm Project? What do you think about it? And how will you be held accountable to the community? I don't know anything about the East Phillips Farm Project. I'm going to learn about it. I'm for farming in the city. And as mayor and as a Minnesota Teamster steward, if I give you my word on something, then it's going to happen. And I'm not going to back off it. I'm for it. I'm going to look into it. And I will support it. And that's the end. That's how I'm going to be mayor. I'm going to stick by my word. I'm not a shill for the DFL or the Republican Party. I'm with the Independence Party, independent for the people. I'm for you. So whatever we need to get done, public safety, housing, farming, and the million other problems and things to do here in the city, I'm going to be an open ear for everybody. Everyone, Republicans, Democrats, independents, liberals, conservatives, what have you, Mike will listen and Mike will do what's best for the people and I'll keep my word. Thank you very much for listening today. Next, Julian Izzad, uh, same question. What do you know about the East Phillips Urban Farm Project? What do you think about it and how will you be held accountable? I know a fair amount about the East Phillips Indoor Urban Farm Project. I used to live uh, one block over from the Roof Depot, so um, spent a lot of time walking my Pekingese past that site, wondering why it was empty in a community that's been so underinvested in by the city. So deeply support the project. I think the city should give the site to the community. We can find the money. Um, we found $35 million to do a military occupation of Minneapolis and Brooklyn Center. So I think we can find the money to create 
jobs, housing, and food in the city. As far as holding myself accountable, I believe in sharing power. That's why I want to do participatory budgeting, because the city council might be about to do a bunch of more squabbling uh, about what gets passed, what doesn't. But if we do participatory budgeting, which means you put money aside for the community to decide how it gets spent, that gets to bypass some of that nonsense, right? And actually get money into what the community needs, not just what the experts or consultants think that we need. And lastly, I hope to be held accountable in the same way that I've been holding electeds accountable for years. And it's by building relationships, it's by showing up, it's by listening, and it's by building our policies and budgets together so our people don't have to keep wasting our energy year after year showing up, demanding, fighting, protesting because our leaders won't lessen or they pay lip service. So I hope to be accountable because I am from the community. I've been doing this work for years and I'm so excited to be the mayor who gets to support the East Phillips Indoor Urban Farm into creation. Thank you. Uh, what do you know about the East Phillips Urban Farm Project? What do you think about it? And how will you be held accountable? Two minutes, please, Mr. Thank Perry. you. I know that the community wants an urban farm, not toxic harm. They've been holding community events over there. We've been to a few of them. And the work is already being done. Again, this comes back to not only hearing, but listening to the community and what it is that they want for their community. Not only does it affect our city, the community, it also affects me and my babies. We live two blocks away from the site where they're proposing to put this water facility. And again, the community is saying they want an urban farm, not toxic harm. And the money can come directly from the city. There's people in that area that are paying taxes. That money can be used to build the urban farm. The facility's already there. All it needs is to be renovated and the things that the community's asking for be put in there. The job of the mayor is to represent the people. The job of the mayor is to have community conversations, see what the community is asking for, and put the ideas together and come up with what is best for the community, not for everybody else in the city. It affects the community, so it's the community that should be deciding what happens to that site. Urban farm, not toxic harm. Thank you. What do you know about the East Phillips Urban Farm Project? What do you think about it? And how will you be held accountable? Cassandra, I'm not sure quite where you went, but thanks for that question. You know, interestingly enough, uh, on Friday I received an email from somebody uh, on this topic, and I called the guy back, and we talked for maybe 25 minutes. He was a really interesting guy. Um, and we talked just a little bit about it. I'm not an expert on it, but uh, what you stated, you know, should it be an urban farm or a public works project? I'm not going to give you the standard political answer and just say, sure, let's do that. I want to look at it carefully and see what's the best way forward. I believe an urban farm could be a really good thing to do. And uh, I don't know why they want to put a public works project there, but let's take a look at that. I just, I don't want to be the kind of candidate who's just out here just telling people what they want to hear. I want people to know I'm the type of candidate who's going to do my homework. I'm going to research things. I'm going to listen to everybody at the table. There's a lot of people at the table. And then I'm going to make decisions that are best to help move our city forward. Urban farm could be good. Let's take a look at it and, and see if that works. Thank you. What do you know about the East Phillips Urban Farm Project? What do you think about it? And how will you be held accountable? Please, two minutes. Yes, thank you, and a really good question. Um, so I, I, I know of the project because I'm executive director at one of the neighborhood organizations. Uh, so we follow work like this on a regular basis. Um, and I'm very much supportive of it uh, to the point where I've actually done some some background research to really find out where the tension is and, and it really is with Public Works being promised to get a new fancy building um, and really for me to, to the question of accountability um, if you just go to my website 
there's a lot of promises in there, but on the front page on my policy platform is the neighborhood promise. And that's not me saying this is just something that I want to do. I am very committed to having a neighborhood-centric approach to governing the city of Minneapolis. So that means, of course, leading with neighborhood uh, partners like the East Phyllis neighborhood, right? And for me, really taking their vision and materializing it into support from the mayor. So um, I hope that me being so public and so bold with what I plan to do in terms of transparency will give you some confidence that I don't plan on abandoning or playing politics with the issue. Uh, and hopefully the fact that I am a member of that organizing body as a neighborhood executive director, that I am firmly committed to the neighborhood. So that's what I would say, and thank you very much. Well, go ahead. Thank you. And so we'll go through one minute closing statements. We'll start with candidate Mike Winter. I just want to say again, chi miigwech to everyone who's here. You guys are making democracy work. I really want to thank these candidates for sitting out here two hours under the hot sun. Impressive endurance. Thanks. Yes. And thank you for stepping forward. And I, I want to say this. You know, I've been part, I've uh, moderated or participated in dozens, maybe hundreds of candidate forums seriously in my life. I have never seen candidates who have been so respectful of time boundaries that have really, I think that just shows respect to the process and to the people that are here. So I just want to say chi miigwech for that, you guys. That's, that's something. So one minute closing statements, please. Mike Winter. I think these are all good candidates for mayor. I've had a chance to meet most of them, but I got to go with me. <laughs> Again. Not DFL, not Republican, not telling their lines. I'm independent. I got my three R's. I want to rebuild and refund the public safety, police, MPD, police department, whatever you want to call it. I want to revitalize business in the city and re energize it again, help out any way I can. And I would like to renew the quality of life in the city with more housing, more help for the homeless and cleaner streets. I don't know if I brought that up. People want more garbage cans in the city, like public garbage cans. That's something I can help with. Um, if you'd like to learn more about me, it's Mike, the number four, MPLS. I'll be at the State Fair almost every day at the Independence Party booth by the grandstand. Come over and see me. Thank you very much for your time, and thank you, everybody, for coming out today. Thank you all so much for staying here, for sticking out, and for caring about what comes next in Minneapolis. Because we get to choose what comes next. The voters of Minneapolis get to choose what comes next. We get to choose to step away from the legacy of institutional violence that led to the murder of George Floyd. We get to choose safety that's based in humanity and caring for one another. We get to choose housing for all through rent control. And we get to choose democracy, right? Making sure that everyone in the city gets an equal say in what happens in our city government. So I'm not just an activist or an organizer. I've got a master's degree uh, from the Humphrey School of Public Policy. I've helped pass national LGBT rights policy. And I've helped move $11 million at the city into violence prevention and to create the mobile mental health teams that are hitting the ground this month. But I'm running for mayor because I think it takes community connection and policy experience to create real change. And that's my time. My name's Sheila. Campaign is Sheila for the people. And please come find me afterwards. All right, thank you again, everybody, for coming out. Thank you to the organizers for being here. Um, I just want to say, I keep hearing people say, we got to look into it. We got to look into it. Um, we're living this. It's our reality. And like I said, the answers are there. If we just listen to people, instead of just hearing them. Just like the death of George Floyd. Now all of a sudden, everybody knows that police brutality exists. I'm a black man, 33 years old. I've known this for 33 years, okay? I've been beaten by the police. I've been racially profiled, pulled over. There are stories out here, and if we sit down and listen to each other, we can get through this. We can help somebody else from going through different things, and we can bring our communities together and move our city to where it needs to go. So let me ask you again. Do you want education investments? Yeah. Do you want youth and young adult outreach investments? Yeah. Do you want housing and home ownership investments? Yeah. Do you want business and ownership investments? Yeah. You want public safety and climate justice investments? Yeah. 
then we must vote Mayor Perry to serve the people of Minneapolis. Our lives and our livelihoods depend on it. The lives of our children depend on it. And the very future of our city depends on your vote this November 2nd. We must vote Mayor Perry to serve the people of Minneapolis. Perry for the people! You know, I take a much more holistic approach to the problems that face Minneapolis. I'm not a single issue candidate. My all-encompassing holistic approach is about promises to the city. Promise one is less politics, more results. Together, we can revive this city. I know we can. We can change its dangerous trajectory. Our city needs to make significant changes if it is going to survive. However, I know we can get our city back to its progressive roots and its successful roots. Don't ever bet against the city of Minneapolis because you'll come up on the losing end of that wager. We need someone who can reframe the discussions and who can approach things from a more dynamic and winning focus. I want Minneapolis to work for everyone. If you want something real and you want something concrete, vote for me on November 2nd. I promise to deliver a new and more dynamic Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, it really has been great. Um, I just want to take the time to just close and really say that, you know, the motivation for me running is really driven by the passion and love that I have for the city. Um, the city has welcomed me and broadly my community at large from the East African community. Um, and it's that, that really, that spark that really drives me to not see the city lose itself. Um, we are really at a crossroads and we really need to have leadership that really is gonna make a difference this year. That means the messenger matters and that means the capacity and the credibility to bring communities and have the lived experiences to understand those very fundamental issues that we're struggling with is important. And I have confidence this year that the people of Minneapolis will make the right decision in supporting AJ Awed. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for sticking it out with us today. I really appreciate you taking the time to hear from and learn from us as candidates, and I have uh, look forward to learning and uh, talking with you more. I'm running for mayor because we are in a moment in Minneapolis where we can make a potential historic turning point towards a city that is truly just, that acts in a way that the racial disparities we have are unacceptable, that builds true climate resilience, and that shows our country what it looks like to build a holistic public safety system that doesn't rely wholly on policing, but includes policing. You know, when I thought about running for mayor, um, it was because I was frustrated with our current mayor's leadership. He has not helped us as a city as a moment because he uh, meet the moment because he has not meant the moment we're in. And I'll be honest, I was like, should I step forward? I'm a white woman, does this make sense? Like, let's be really real. We are a diverse, vibrant city who needs leadership that is going to bring us together, not just towards unity, but to create justice on the path towards unity. We need to create justice on the path towards unity. So I ask for your vote. I ask for your support. And most, I ask for you to dig deep and believe in and find the courage to build a Minneapolis that we know we can have and that we are all capable of building together. Uh, to all the candidates, again, huge thanks to everyone that came out today. Big election this November. You can check out Ranked Choice Voting. They're tabling over here. Sign up with Make Voting a Tradition. Uh, and I just want to say chimbiquitch to all the candidates for hanging in there, for participating today. Let's show them our appreciation. You guys can you know, uh, as the candidates leave the stage, we are did commit to providing time for our candidates who weren't registered to participate but wanted to address the crowd. You're welcome to go. Uh, so uh, three minutes each to the timers. Three minutes. Yep, speaking, and our first candidate is Clint Connor. Mr. Connor, welcome. Well, thank you to the organizers for putting this together, and thank you so much for sticking with us and your patience. My name is Clint Connor, and as Robert mentioned, I am also running for mayor. I'm so new that I was unable to participate in the Q&A, but I wanted to introduce myself because I am the leader that this city needs. I love technology, and I love efficiency, so I became an engineer. I love great ideas and I love to debate issues, so I went to law school and became a patent litigator. I love to sweat, so I took up boxing. 
And I absolutely love this city and its multiculturalism. And so I'm running to be your mayor. The city, all of it, is suffering under the leadership of Mayor Jacob Fry. Four years after he ran on a platform of improving police community relations, look where we are. Things have spiraled out of control. Violence is skyrocketing. 19 children were either killed or injured by bullets in just the first four months of this year alone. That's unacceptable. You might ask yourself, why is someone like me, white guy, I've got three children, getting headlong into this race, which is messy during a divided time? I'm doing so because we need safe streets, safe streets, safe streets. Secondly, we need stable, affordable, and livable housing for all of Minneapolis. No one talks about livability. Thirdly, we need a small business boom. People who know me know that I'm uniquely suited for this job. I have courage, I have experience, and the kind of skills needed to lead the city on a march directly into the headwinds and to tackle the most serious issues we faced as a city. You know, being a mayor in good times might be easy, but bringing us back to good times takes hard work and a commitment to being out in front of the issues and on the front lines. And no one will outwork me, no one. Simply put, we need to keep the good police officers we do have. I've got the energy, passion, and commitment to bring people up and change the narrative and bring up the morale in the city and with our police department, which is critical. On housing, there's not a single person on this stage that's done more for low-income tenants and owners in the city. Might not look like it, but that's true. I've spent over hundreds of hours working with low-income tenants and housing in the, in the city, and I'll use my background and connections to achieve racial equity in housing in the city. And I'm to bring together experts and business leaders to really fundamentally think how we can help our small businesses, which our immigrant communities and BIPOC communities rely on for freedom. That's my story. My name is Clint Connor. I hope you go to clintconnor2021.com. You'll learn more about me and my platform. And I hope that you would vote for me November 2nd. And if you don't vote for me, I hope you vote for me 2nd on November 2nd. This is Ranked Choice Voting. So please, go home, read about me, spread the word. I'd very much appreciate it. By the way, I want to say, the candidates were great, and I also want to give a shake here to Perry because his words and his story really resonated with me, and um, cheers to you, sir. All right, thank you very much. So I will introduce Minneapolis mayoral candidate, Paul Johnson. Thank you for sticking around. Uh, I'm Paul Johnson, Northside resident, small business owner, and fighter for justice. Uh, my, my fee for coming into this mayoral race was paid over three years ago when the police came to my house on a wellness check and shot my friend in three minutes and 45 seconds of their quote-unquote de-escalation. Back in 2011, a cousin of mine, also in a mental health state, also killed by the police. I do not pander to any party affiliates. Uh, actually, the only independent one is who names their own party, and we are equity in motion. Why that is, is because we're already doing the work that so many of these candidates are talking about starting doing should they get their, your vote. No, this work needs to be done now. Every day that passes, people are dying because politicians are using our legislation as uh, political coins for the trading. No more. Accountability starts by being in the office with senators like Paul Gazelka, being in the office with uh, Governor Walls, and telling them directly, you're not doing anything. Our families, families supporting families against police violence, I have their full endorsement. We are uh, 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 led by Tashira Gateway, all families of p people with stolen lives. I have their endorsement, the Minnesota Justice Coalition. We wrote 11 bills for legislation last year, four of them making it to the floor, two of them passing. We now have one nicknamed after Travis, which is the legal responsibility for 911 to stop sending police to mental health calls. 
Okay, we had co-responder programs in every single county in Minnesota, but 911, their duty was to the police, and the police said we want to do those calls instead of the co-responder programs. Okay, this are many, many policies, many things that people are going to promise you, but where are things already getting done? Right here. Paul Johnson and all of his friends and all of the movement. We're the ones who got Derek Chauvin arrested. We're the ones who got him convicted. We're the ones who make the change. Not any politician who's gonna lie to you and tell you that they can make great changes on things that they actually have no power over. Instantly, we will be putting in the Camden use of force policy. From day one, we will start training on it. They went from 35 to 40 complaints a week to five a year and no murders. Jacob Fry could have done that any single year he was here. We're headed there next week to specifically speak to that, to that police department and then uh, be in Washington with a nationally led group of victims of police violence so that we can get legislation passed nationally, not just on the state level, not just on the city level. So if you wanna see things that are already in motion, if you wanna see things where your safety is already my concern, I don't need your vote, I'm doing this with it, then you'll vote Paul for Minneapolis. That's Paul, number four, MPLS.com, Paul E. Johnson for Minneapolis on Facebook, share, share, share. You guys, we need to take our city back. The community is us. We will win. We rise. All power to the people. All right, miigwech. Thanks, everyone, for your attention. You've been very respectful. It's been a great forum.